Hi, wonderful to have you all here. I'm Olivia Shumlin. I'm one of Putney's co-directors. And along the way, I'm going to be joined by my sister and co-director, Becca Shumlin, along with our colleagues and longtime directors, Julian, Patrick, and Mike, who will all introduce themselves before they begin. Um, so I will start just by walking you through our history to give those who may be newer to the organization a sense of where we came from and who we are. We are heading into our 74th summer as a family-run organization. Um, and before us on the right of the screen, you'll see my grandparents, George and Kitty Shumlin, who were Putney's founders. They were both um, passionate educators. Kitty is now in her mid nineties. She's Dutch and grew up in occupied Holland. And George was a teacher and a World War II vet. And they met in sort of a, a storybook moment when George was um, traveling one summer. He was on the GI Bill to continue his late education studies after the war. And the two of them fell in love on a ship crossing and married um, not long after. So it was a very romantic story. And actually, in fact, the honeymoon of their marriage was the original Putney trip you'll see there on the top um, to Western Europe. And it's actually a program that we still offer to this day. And so back in, in the 50s and 1951, they traveled by steamship. They had 16 students in tow. I think it took over 10 days to get there and then another 10 days to travel back um, from that program. And one thing that's just really important to emphasize is the idea behind that voyage was very much a response to a post-conflict world they were living in at the time. So they really saw, you know, the value of guiding students out of their comfort zone and unifying people from all walks of life through meaningful face-to-face -face interactions and connections and allowing students you know, the opportunity to learn and grow and challenge themselves and collaborate across lines of difference, all while keeping them safe. And ultimately, they really saw this as the way to help build common ground um, and shape thoughtful and well-rounded young leaders and contribute to a more inclusive and just society. So they really quickly discovered the profound impact of educational travel um, to be incredibly transformative. Um, moving along, uh, this photo here, our longtime co-director Jeff snapped this photo around, I think it was 1979, while leading our language immersion program in France. And then the subsequent photo was taken a bit more recently by one of our longtime leaders and longtime directors, Karen Phillips, who's actually the wife of Patrick, one of our directors who you'll meet soon. Karen was, was leading the same program that Jeff was leading, um, hiking in the French Alps. The group happened to stop for a picnic on the same rock and you'll see that they captured a very almost identical shot. So you'll notice a real through line of continuity of the Putney tradition and the kind of things we do, the long standing history and the places where we go and where we've maintained really sustainable relationships within our networks of incredible contacts across the globe that make these unique experiences possible. Here you'll see our uncle Jeff and dad Peter, George and Kitty's sons. Uh, Peter, our dad, has a really interesting distinction. He served as Vermont's 81st governor, and he's been back with us at Putney ever since. And we're really fortunate to benefit from his unique connections and the incredible context that he's built, both in our home state, but also around the world from that experience. Um, and there should be a... Next slide. Yes, this here really captures the multi-generational nature of the organization today. The far left, you'll see my sister and co-director Becca, who you'll be introduced to soon. Grandmother Kitty, who you know all about now, Putney's founders. And then my son, Max, there representing the fourth generation. He just celebrated his third birthday, actually, this past weekend. So. That is a bit of our history. And, you know, it's really important, I think, to emphasize that Putney is a much larger organization than just family members. We have a really passionate team of program directors and colleagues with diverse backgrounds and knowledge that are really at the heart of our organization. You'll see them here. Um, so we all collaborate together under Putney, Putney's roof, which we affectionately call the barn. 
it is an old converted cow barn at the end of a dirt road in southern Vermont. And we always, always encourage families to visit us if they're ever up this way. Many do. And it's a really, really special place to work. It's um, beautiful. There's wonderful cross-country skiing trails to enjoy in the winter and a lovely pond for swimming in the summer. Um, and our collection of, of directors includes Peace Corps volunteers, uh, former teachers, parents. We have a licensed ship captain, outdoor adventurers, MFA graduates, anthropologists, experiential educators, and, and many more. And I would say they each really bring um, a diversity of experience and languages spoken, a wealth of specialized knowledge to our programs. And I think because they've all really seen how impactful and meaningful interaction and education through travel at a young age can be. Um, we feel really privileged to work with them on a daily basis and I would highly encourage you to reach out so you have the opportunity to get to know them a bit as well. Um, moving along, so these are just a few of many sentiments that we receive and hear from parents as their students return home at the end of the summer. Um, I think, you know, the first two in particular really resonate and kind of bring us back to our core mission and the notion of imparting global stewardship through experiential, intellectual, and cultural engagement, and really the tremendous amount of growth that comes with that. Um, you know, our students return with a tremendous amount of confidence, strengthened values, and really a renewed sense of agency and a real excitement, which I think is more relevant today, maybe than before, that really the future is theirs to shape. Um, and it's certainly one of the most inspiring outcomes of the work that we all do here together. So I will now turn it over to my colleague, Julian Hartman-Russell, to segue into our programs for summer 2025. Thank you. Thanks, Liv. My name is Julian, je parle français et hablo espagnol, and I am a program director here at Putney for about six years now. Um, I'm happy to be here with you all today. So we're gonna run over some of our 2025 programs. As you can see on this map here, we run programs in many different parts of the world. Um, and our programs fall under an umbrella of, of several different categories and each type of program follows a specific structure. And we're gonna go over what those look like uh, coming up next. Some of our programs are specific to high school students and some are specific to middle school students, but we do have programs that we have different groups of high schoolers and middle schoolers in the same place, like Italy and Greece, we have a high school option and a middle school option. So check out our website, you can see all the different possibilities. Uh, we can't go in depth through all 30 plus destinations today, uh, but please give us a call if you're interested in, in any, any programs we have. We love chatting on the phone and we're happy to, to connect with you uh, anytime during the week to, to talk about our, our favorite programs. <laughs> so we're first gonna start with service. Our service programs are designed for small groups of student travelers, typically between 16 and 18 students traveling with two qualified group leaders. Uh, these programs are typically between two and four weeks long, uh, and we run them in many different parts of the world. Um, generally, on our service programs, students and leaders are living together in a small host community that we've been working with for many, many years, uh, where we typically set up three or four projects of different types. Uh, we work really closely with trusted longtime contacts in each community, uh, like the local governing body or town board to help determine projects and figure out what is the greatest need and potential for having a, a meaningful and lasting impact. So typically on a service program, we have a primary project in the morning, which is generally construction-based, where we, lock, we work alongside local foremen or masons on the, on the work site, and we learn construction skills from them. Um, and then in the afternoons, we typically will have a, a variety of secondary projects, which range from agricultural projects or, or garden projects to uh, education projects and later construction projects. And students get to rotate through the different the different projects during the program to to see you know depending on their interests. So for for example, in Ecuador, for the last few years, we've been working on a community-run eco lodge in our host community, um, and it's I, it's almost done, which has been a real momentous thing to see over the past few years. Each Putney group has contributed a different part of that structure, and the, the community is really excited to start hosting. Uh, having more ecotourism, ecotourism visitors come and stay there. Um, so our groups are, gener are out in the field every day. They're actively involved in planning and implementing projects. Um, and as I said, they rotate through different types of projects uh, each day that they're in the community. 
our, our service philosophy is that we're not really, you know, we're not an aid organization, but our belief is that service can provide a really unique way to connect and build bonds with local people um, and contribute to a meaningful project that benefits people's lives. So it's a, it's a catalyst for authentic cultural exchange, um, and it, it's an easy way to create friendships with local people, which is why we think these programs are so great. Um, each student will have the opportunity to pursue an independent project on all of our travel programs, um, but in, uh, on a service program, this could be shadowing a dairy farmer for the day, uh, learning to cook a traditional Peruvian meal and cooking it for the group with local friends, <laughs> uh, things like that, where they get to tap into something that's interesting to them and share it with the, the rest of the group. We, on the service programs, we also have weekend excursions where we further explore the cultural or environmental landscape of the area. And then we come back to the host community to continue service work. Um, and then we have a big farewell gathering and party at the end of the program. So some of these excursions might be, you know, in Ecuador, we go to, we take an excursion up to Cotopaxi National Park. We go horseback riding up in the high Andean grasslands, which is absolutely spectacular. Uh, in Nepal, we do a multi-day trek in the Everest Valley. Uh, and we so we try to, you know, match some of these excursion activities with uh, great service projects, um, have a, a good overall experience. And then we also have a certificate that students receive at the end for the service hours that they contributed. Next, we're gonna move on and talk about exploration programs. Uh, these are adventure travel and cultural immersion based programs. They're small group travel programs for middle and high school students and typically between two and four or just over four weeks long with two uh, qualified group leaders. So these are more itinerary based programs. So with service, you're typically living in one place for most of the program. On exploration programs, we're staying in different locations for between three to five days. Um, and engaging with different aspects of culture and adventure in each place we go. So we really get off the beaten path um, and have all kinds of adventurous outdoorsy experiences, but also we try to get to uh, under the surface a little bit in some of the bigger cities we go to like Paris or Amsterdam. And we have lots of wonderful contacts that help us um, learn more about culture in each of these places. So we might go glacier hiking in the Swiss Alps. Um, we do a three or four day bike trip through rural Holland where we stay at guest houses each night. Um, and then we, you know, we spend four days in Paris on some of our programs. There's a wide range of, of uh, exploration programs out there. So I definitely suggest taking a look. We also have some really outdoorsy ones. We have a skiing in Patagonia program, which I actually led a couple of years ago and highly recommend uh, if you're into skiing. We have a, a Kilimanjaro hiking program, which is also um, really, really wonderful and a great experience. Some of our exploration programs have a day stay component or a homestay component. So that's a way for students to have a little bit more of an immersive experience with local people. And something that we find is immensely rewarding every year, students report that it's the highlight of their experience. And um, so you look out for those on some of those exploration programs. Students also will do an independent project on exploration programs, which could be cooking a traditional Tuscan meal, designing an anime storyboard in Tokyo, uh, things like that. It really depends on the location and the student's interest, but we do try to, we encourage really creative, fun projects like that. So that's it for exploration. I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Patrick, to share about our language programs. Great, thanks, Julian. Um, my name is Patrick. This is my 25th year with Putney Student Travel. Uh, 25 years ago, I led my first Putney program. It was a language immersion program in Spain. Um, and even at that time, a lot of the contacts uh, and communities that we worked with, we'd been working with for decades. So that long history, especially on these language immersion programs that we have, really um, plays a big role in the programs. They are similar in size uh, to the ones that Julian has been talking about, 16 to 18 students with two leaders, differentiated between high school and middle school programs. We do Spanish, French, and Mandarin. We're excited to go back to China um, post-pandemic for the first time, that, uh, well, first time post-pandemic this year. We have a long history in China, actually. Putney was one of the first high school groups allowed to visit the country in the early 80s. Um, and we actually had a documentary made about the Putney group there. Uh, so we're excited to go back. Um, all of these programs are immersion programs. Students take a pledge to speak only in the target language during the trip. And our philosophy is that the vast majority of our students are coming from very um, 
uh, high pressure sort of academic backgrounds, incredible academic backgrounds, um, but they're getting a lot of the in front of a whiteboard, uh, vocabulary lessons, um, drilling verbs, uh, and what we don't want to do in the summer is replicate that environment. We want to get students out in the world, um, putting that language to use um, with uh, producing the language, meeting people using in real world contexts, um, and so that they get excited about it and see, and their further learning in the language just gets supercharged by those experiences in country. So for example, how this plays out in our Ecuador program, um, after you know flying into Quito, we go to a community that has hosted us for many years. And during the mornings, we might have some structured language lessons from our leaders, but then go out and do service projects side by side with people from the community, um, mixing that service work and language learning. We go on excursions, we go to Cotopaxi, we spend some time in the Galapagos doing conservation work um, and learning about the amazing ecology there at the end. All things that are designed to connect you with the language in meaningful ways. Uh, in France and Spain, we tend to, and also in, in China, we do a little bit more travel-based itineraries. We go from small towns um, to larger cities. Small towns afford us the opportunity to really connect with locals, a third-generation cheesemaker in a, the hills of uh, Asturias in Spain, for example. Um, the larger cities give us cultural opportunities to go to restaurants and museums, um, and we find that that really um, allows students to get to know all facets of, of the local culture. Um, we do have homestays or day stays, uh, typically a week long on all the programs, um, except for the Valencia and Pyrenees program. That one, we actually spend a week in the Pyrenees with a group of Spanish peers and get a chance to do a lot of exciting um, and active rafting and horseback riding and things like that. Um, we do recognize that there are a range of uh, language abilities on any given language program so that we have requirements for the amount of language you need to have taken. But we also, our leaders sit down with students on the very first day of the program, go over an individual kind of language plan. They do, uh, each student does an independent project as well. And the goal of all of these programs is to, they'll return to the classroom and return to um, their lives with a sense of confidence in speaking the language and understanding it and really excitement that they're going to, they've really connected with it. And then when they're presented with uh, that, the verbs of the whiteboard, once again, it really connects to a real world experience that they've had. It's an amazing jumping off point, especially at a young age, to pursue language learning in the future and get them excited about that. Uh, another category of program that we have is our career programs. Uh, these are, again, small group, uh, typically 16 to 18, sometimes as many as you know, 21, 22 students. They are an in-depth exploration of a particular area of interest or a field of study or a passion um, in a global context. So going to um, Namibia, for example, to study big cat conservation or farm to table. We have an amazing farm to table program in Italy where you learn harvesting and sewing and cooking and heirloom recipes. Um, it really is uh, phenomenal or something like the business of sport in Barcelona, engineering and robotics um, at MIT. Um, you can see that each of these really strives to get students in contact with a particular potential future career um, in a place where it really comes alive. And we are able to, the leaders are not, not only are the leaders um, sort of experts in these themes, but a specific expert joins the program um, for a portion of it. So for example, on our CERN and science program in Switzerland, Richard Harris, who's a science journalist and has been for 35 years at NPR, you probably would recognize his voice if you heard it, um, comes and joins the program each summer. So I think it'll be his fourth year in a row because he loves the curiosity and the energy of the students. And it's amazing glimpse for them into careers in science um, or you know, animal conservation or photography or writing. Uh, and it provides this wonderful cohort of other students who are interested in similar things and professional contacts through the experts and the leaders as well. These programs also conclude with an independent project of a student's choosing so they can you know, bring home and demonstrate that knowledge and the technical skills they learned on the program. Uh, it really is inspiring to see how they come back um, with even more knowledge and inspiration to continue perhaps down a career path that they, they thought they might be interested in but didn't, didn't really know until just now. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Mike, to talk about our pre-college programs. Thank you, Patrick. My name is Mike Oster. I'm a program director here and a hiring director. And I also 
manage our collaboration with the Smithsonian Institution, which I'll talk about a little bit towards the end. Uh, I've been with Putney now. This is my 13th full-time season. I started as a leader back in 2007, and I've also worked in the experiential education, outdoor education space for about 20 years. Um, I'm excited to talk about our pre-college programs or a little bit of a shift from everything that we were talking about previously. Uh, everything that Julian and Patrick spoke about were our small group, 16 to 18 students, itinerary-based programs for the most part. Our pre-college programs are uh, more campus-based at three different destinations uh, around the world for this summer. So if we flip to the next slide, we'll see Barcelona, Tokyo, and Tuscany for 2025. So these are opportunities for a larger group of students, about 50 or so is the capacity of, of each of these destinations, uh, to come together and be more stationary in a location while being able to explore seminar topics of their choosing. So while we might have 50 total students on the program with a larger staff of maybe 8, 10, 12 people, um, we split the students into seminars of their choosing. So when they apply for the program, they could choose something like photography, fashion, cuisine, language seminars, business and banking and markets, a lot of different options depending on the destination. These programs are about three weeks long. And Monday through Friday in the mornings, usually the groups split up into their smaller seminar cohorts, maybe 10 to 12 students per seminar. We try to keep it small. And it's an opportunity for these students to uh, interact with their peers and a destination through the lens of that seminar without the pressure of grades or tests. So things that students know they're passionate about or just have a curiosity in. These are great opportunities for these students to explore those things in a more college style setting where they're living in a communal dorm space or accommodation space, eating meals together, breaking up into those smaller seminars during the day. And then in the afternoons and evenings, coming back together as a larger group for a lot of optional extracurricular activities or, or not optional, but giving students a choice of afternoon and evening activities to be able to interact with the instructors of other seminars that maybe they're not directly enrolled in, but maybe interested in learning a bit more and to interact with the group as a whole. And just like on our small group programs, that sense of community is really important on these trips. So every meeting, every evening, uh, there's a community meeting where we check in with each other, go over kind of what the plan is for tomorrow, how today went, what the groups are working on in their individual smaller seminars. So it really gives students an opportunity to connect with peers really from all over the world. We get international students on these programs. And uh, you know we also give our students a little bit of ownership and freedom on these programs. They are still structured. Um, so we're not just you know letting students free for hours at a time in Barcelona, but we do give them opportunities in small groups to explore market markets and cafes and grab lunch and um, you know go to the beach in the afternoon with a, their instructors and a group of peers. So just a little bit different model than the other small group programs, but um, you know really great for intellectually curious students. And one of the reasons why I love talking about these programs as a hiring director is that I get to uh, work with our team to hire the staff for these programs. And these are often instructors that work professionally, have masters or PhDs in the subject matter, and they're really able to bring the content of these programs to life in a hands-on way. These are not classroom-based seminars. You may have a little bit of time in a classroom uh, to get the basics down, but the idea is that we are out and about in Barcelona, in Tokyo, in Tuscany, in the countryside, um, doing site visits, hands-on activities to really bring these the subject matter to life. And our instructors are so good at kind of getting to know their students on the first day of the seminar, find out what exactly brought them to the program, why they chose the seminar, what their experience and background is, and really cater kind of their curriculum, their teaching, the activities that we do to that specific group of students um, that they have in any given year. So the seminars kind of adapt and evolve summer after summer based on the, the students and the instructors that we bring in uh, to teach these seminars. 
So really great opportunity for students from all over the world with different, you know, wide ranging interests and backgrounds. So from there, um, we'll move on to the next slide, which is about how to choose a program. We offer a lot of different types of programs for different age groups, for different ranges of time, for different themes. And really, you know, we get a lot of parents that call and say, what's, what's your most favorite program? What's your most popular program? What should my student do this summer? And our job isn't, I mean, all of us, I think, have our programs that we are especially connected to. But the idea is that we want to help you and your student find the program that's the right fit for them. So it starts on our website. You can search by collection. You can search for programs that are new for 2025 or just photo programs or wildlife focused programs. But you can also search by destination, by length of time. Um, by age group, all of those things. And then once you kind of narrow those thoughts down, we encourage you to call us, speak with our admissions team, speak with a program director um, directly uh, to answer specific questions about those programs. We can put you in touch with families from previous years that have traveled with us. We can put you um, in touch with, um, you know, the people that know the programs the best and help you to make that decision. So we're here to help. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Becca to talk a little bit more about kind of why Putney out of all the options that are out there in the world. Thank you, Mike. And hello, everyone. I am Becca Shumlin, co-director of Putney, along with my sister Liv. So the other half of that third generation of leadership that she just told you a little bit about. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about a few of the really common threads that define Putney across the board and what it is that sets our programs apart. Um, and that starts with our leaders who are passionate educators who take the time away from their busy lives and professions to return to lead programs for us summer after summer. And they do that because they want to be here and they want to share their knowledge with our students. Um, our leaders are really like family to us, and in many ways, they become family to our students. Um, they're actively involved in our students' lives and fully participating in all elements of the program. They're experts in the places that they go. They speak the language. They're engaging and dynamic and fun. Um, and they're just, they're terrific role models. And here, the one that you see on the screen here, um, this is Rebecca Frank. She is one of our incredible summer leaders. She received her bachelor's degree in creative writing and then went on to NYU's Tisch graduate program for acting. Um, Rebecca is an accomplished writer, actor, and educator, and she's been an instructor on many of our pre-college programs. Um, I wish I could tell you more about many of our incredible leaders, but I encourage you to check out our website um, and look at some of their bios. And our instructors on our pre-college and Oxford Academia programs are also outstanding. They're academics at esteemed institutions and just brilliant accomplished professionals. They provide a really unique opportunity for high school students to get a really engaging, immersive, and also fun learning experience that most students just don't have access to at their high schools or at home. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later when we cover Oxford Academia, but I encourage you to go to those websites too and check them out. Um, as you can probably tell, uh, we take great pride in the fact that across all of our programs, we are getting off the beaten track and really going places. This is not a, you know, get on the bus, snap a picture and get back on the bus kind of experience. For example, when we are on safari in Tanzania, which you see here, we do a walking safari with the Maasai where we are literally walking through ancestral homelands, someone leading with a spear in the back and one at the front. Um, and it's an experience and something that you just don't get to see typically. And it's because of these longstanding connections that both Liv and Patrick have touched on earlier um, that we're really able to do these unusual things that 
most students and travelers, if they go to these places, just do not get to experience. Our programs are designed around genuine interaction with our host communities who are passionate about sharing the heart of their culture with us. And it's these deep relationships that we have with our local contacts and the communities, some of which you've heard originated with my and Liv's grandparents. Um, and those have continued for multiple generations and getting to share those connections and seeing our students build lasting connections of their own is truly at the center of everything that we do in all of our programs. Our students spend a lot of time in the classroom during the year and Putney's programs are focused on getting them outside of that and doing so in creative, dynamic and experiential ways. Students are using their hands, getting out and about and engaging on a deeper level and not just passively receiving information. So over for over 73 years, one thing that we've learned is great programs start and end with the best group dynamics. So we deliberately keep our groups small and they're very carefully curated. Students and leaders are there, they're on these programs because they want to be there. And they stay in touch long for a long time after the program. They're meeting people from all over the world and the country together creating this inclusive environment and creating space for a transformational experience with people who share that exact same passion. And um, all of our programs are very highly structured, which you've heard a bit about already. We are always doing something in an organized way with the leaders all of the time. Our philosophy is, you are going to get the most out of a place if there is structure in place. And we believe in packing iter itineraries to the brim, making the most out of our time on the ground. Um, but just because there's structure does not mean that it isn't also fun. Have fun. <laughs> we know that students who apply to our programs have really high pressure school years and even beyond school, just a lot on them. Um, we really get that, and that's why we want you to have fun. These programs are really all about having fun. Um, and now I will turn it back over to Patrick. Great. Thanks, Becca. Um, so Becca has given, I think, the philosophical underpinnings of the program. I just want to go through some of the logistical things, some questions that you can and should be asking um, when you're thinking about what kind of program is right for your family, your student. Um, and obviously, the first uh, thing on your mind, likely the first thing on our minds, is safety, health, risk management. Um, 74 years, every single student who's traveled with, with us has returned home safe and sound. We plan to continue that. Um, we have a multi-step approach to this. The first being that the long history that we've all talked about a bit um, really does us well in the sense that we have trusted local contacts, clinics, hospitals in countries where English is not the first language, places where we know doctors speak English. In many cases, we're going to the same hospitals a Peace Corps volunteer would go to. Um, and we have experience there. And we have local contacts um, you know, who, who guide us if we encounter a health or a safety situation. Um, we also teach safety to our students. When you come on a Putney program, you fill out a health form beforehand. If there's any concerns that we have or that you have, we're able to talk them out beforehand and make sure that we can address them before the program starts um, and plan for them. Uh, and we then, when we get in-country, we are have a big in-country orientation that teaches safety to our students, our approach um, to keeping safe throughout the trip. Uh, all of our leaders are CPR and first aid certified. Many of them have certifications that go far beyond that. Um, and then as an ultimate backup, uh, all of our international programs outside the US, we do enroll students in international SOS, which is an emergency um, evacuation in case we're up on a high mountain and we have an accident and we need to get helicoptered off. You know, knock on wood, we've had to use it incredibly few times, always with great outcomes. Um, but that, that risk plan and that safety plan is first and foremost in our programmers' minds. Part of this and part of any safety and health management is 
communication and we strive to maintain really open lines of communication with parents throughout the summer and students and obviously our leaders. Um, we keep close contact with our leaders while programs in the field and we communicate information. You know, if we are going to a clinic, for example, we're communicating that directly to you as a parent, getting you involved. Um, during the summer, we have a 24 hour emergency line here. Um, during the, the normal day, we have uh, usually around 100 to 150 uh, summer leading years of experience on the phones at any given time to help out with something in the nights and weekends and evenings. Um, we also have a team of people um, who the phone rings beside their bed. Uh, we can draw in um, the entire team um, for anything that comes up. Uh, and so knowing that you can use that, our leaders can also call that at any time. Um, and for more low key interactions, you know, hopefully the vast majority of them, um, we have our program blogs. So every two or three days, we strive to post a blog entry, certainly when we arrive in country, about exciting events so that you and family members can kind of keep in touch and, you know, know and understand, you know, what's going on in the program, um, even without being directly in touch. Um, we do allow students to bring a cell phone on Putney programs. However, you know, we're very conscious of the impacts of technology on our groups, on our group dynamics, and our ability to bond with our local communities. So for all students, you can bring a phone for your travel days. Um, you can, uh, that helps you to meet the group. Um, and on your, on your travel day home as well, that helps you, you know, make your connecting flights. For our middle school programs, um, our leaders hold on to students' phones during the program, and they can use them to check in about once a week. Um, for high school groups, uh, students keep their phones, but we have a tech fast um, after we arrive in country, and we're able to check back in with home. Um, we have students, uh, we lock the phones, and then students keep them. They can continue to use them as cameras or for emergency calls. Um, but for the first half of the program, uh, they then, that's all they can use them for. We do, if that tech fast lasts for longer than a week, we unlock the phones every week to allow for a quick check-in with home. But we find that getting students to look at each other and look at the world around them rather than their phones um, really provides a good basis for getting to know each other and bonding. Um, and we have heard from students and leaders um, that have done this tech fast because we've been doing it for a number of years that, that it is one of the most impactful things that they do over the summer and does really give them an opportunity to see the world in a different way. Um, as far as travel goes, we do coordinate group flights on uh, the vast majority of our programs, with the exception of ones that are, are here in the US, where you meet us at a, a, a point here in the US. Um, those group flights um, depart typically out of uh, either New York or Miami or LA, or in certain cases, San Francisco. Um, we let you know, obviously, ahead of time. Um, the majority of students do tend to fly on that group flight, but over and back, they are accompanied by one of your leaders who's going to be leading the program throughout, or in the case of our pre-college programs, by uh, a flight escort. Um, <clears throat> however, there are a number of families who um, would prefer to meet us in country. They're already doing some traveling, or at the end of the program, would like to to meet their student and go on a family vacation of their own. And we can be flexible with that. We can request deviations. Um, if you have airline miles that you want to use, we can also help out with that. So um, long story short is that we do have group flights reserved, but we can be very flexible, especially with lead time uh, to accommodate uh, anything that your family might want. Um, as far as the application process goes, um, you have uh, many of you have probably already visited our website. There's an apply now button right there. Once you click that, um, you will be uh, asked for a few to create an online login, some contact information, some information about your student, um, and then choosing a program. Um, you can also choose a backup program uh, or a second choice program, but know that we, if, uh, if your first choice program is full, we don't automatically enroll you in your second choice program. We're going to call you and talk about it. Um, and as of right now, um, we do have space in all of our programs. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, but once you select your program, a $700 deposit holds your space in the program. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and then we let you know that your space is held. And there's a few more steps to complete your application. Um, you'll go back into that digital locker. There's a short personal statement that is not meant to be a college essay. It's just uh, something that allows you to explain of all the things you could do in the world. Uh, why would you want to do this? What is your particular passion? Um, and then we ask for two teacher references. So we know that teachers are busy. Um, we uh, ask you for their names, their email addresses. We email them with a link to fill out a short online form. Uh, and 
what we're really asking them is with our local connections and contacts that we've been working with for so many years, is your student going to be a good ambassador um, to those uh, communities? And also are they excited about doing this program? And of course they'll answer yes. Once we have all of those materials, we make our admissions decision usually within a day or two um, and get back to you and let you know that you've been accepted. Once you're accepted onto the program, that same login becomes um, your uh, login to your digital locker. And that's where your packing list, your travel information, all sorts of information that we need to get to you and information that you need to get to us, your health forms, your connecting travel information, it all runs through the digital locker. That $700 deposit, I should also say, um, all but $200 of it is refundable up until March 15th. So if your plans change, you're only, only risking $200 until March 15th. After March 15th, our, all of our accommodations and airline things become non-refundable because uh, we do have our, our deposits due as well. Um, but there is some flexibility. And I bring that up because um, we are currently, this is our 74th year, we are experiencing a tremendous boom in terms of early season enrollment to the degree that it's the highest it's ever been in 74 years. So if there are programs that you see that you would like to be uh, considered for, I would say, um, uh, please try and apply sooner rather than later. Hold your space sooner rather than later. Once you hold your space, there's a little bit of time to complete the application. Um, but uh, there are, on some of our small group trips of 16 students, we already have 11, 12, 13 students. Um, so give us a call um, if you want to know uh, about space available, availability. Um, but again, as of now, there's space in all of our programs. However, some of it's going pretty quickly. Um, and then finally, we do have scholarship opportunities. Um, these are available through the Putney Open Door Fund. It's a nonprofit uh, foundation whose purpose is to eliminate barriers to travel for young people seeking educational travel experiences. You can go on the website at the URL here to see about the eligibility requirements. Um, it is a separate application process because it does not require a deposit. So if you are going to apply for a scholarship, please apply through the link on that page rather than the general application because the scholarship link does not um, require a deposit. Uh, the um, the scholarship is a full scholarship. It also pays for all international travel and all connecting travel to get to the international travel. Um, there's a February 15th deadline for those scholarship applications. It is a hard deadline. So the earlier you start, the better. In case there are missing pieces, we can always reach out to you and say, hey, you're missing a few things before that February 15th. Finally, I'd love to turn it back to Becca to talk a little bit about um, our uh, collaborations that we have um, with a number of other organizations, our partners. Thank you, Patrick. Yes, we have a series of really exciting programs that we organize in collaboration with some incredible partners. Um, I will start with Oxford Academia, which was created in collaboration with uh, Professor James Basker. And I'll just briefly tell you a bit about Jim. Um, he has taught at Harvard, Cambridge, and teaches at Barnard, Columbia. And he runs the Gilder Lehrman Institute of History in New York. Um, and he's directed summer programs at Oxford for over 30 years. He's a very busy guy. Um, he brings his unique resources, academic expertise, and a caliber of faculty and staff to the program that high school students just otherwise wouldn't have access to. Um, and these programs take place at three different iconic universities, Oxford, Yale, and the American University of Paris. And each one has two two-week sessions, so two sets of dates that run back to back. And we've structured the dates to allow for flexibility and the option to combine them into a four-week experience. So you could do two weeks or four weeks at one, Oxford, Paris, or Yale, or you can mix and match. So first two weeks at Oxford and then hop over to the American University of Paris for another two weeks there or vice versa. Um, they can also be combined with other pre-college and Putney career programs and families do receive a tuition reduction for joining multiple programs. Uh, these programs are for current ninth through 12th graders and we will also accept applications for motivated rising ninth graders. And when students apply, they choose an academic major and a minor seminar, which they pursue on the program amongst a small group of peers, um, which are taught by distinguished educators in a supportive, immersive, and engaging environment. And the majors meet 
six days a week, including Saturday mornings in the after in the sorry, including Saturday mornings in the morning. And the minors meet three days a week for two hours in the afternoon. They are small seminars, usually around 15 or fewer students. The curriculum is carefully designed. Um, and some of the subjects are interdisciplinary. We have fashion design and culture or world and world history, for example. And the teaching is really imaginative and student-centered. There are no final exams, no long essays, and the learning really takes shape in the form of collaborative projects and debates, spontaneous presentations, and extramural work. Um, and the majority of the instructors on the Oxford Academia, Academia programs are tenured faculty, uh, distinguished Oxford, Rhodes, Marshall, and Gates scholars, and accomplished professionals. And they're all deeply knowledgeable and passionate about the subject, and they just love working with our students and come back every summer. Um, and then in addition to the faculty, we have a large residential life staff on each program. So these are student deans and junior deans who reside in the dorms with the students and who completely dedicate their summers to making sure that every single student there is happy and healthy and just getting the absolute most out of the experience. Um, these are larger programs. They're uh, bigger than the typical Putney program, usually between 80 to 200 students, roughly, depending on which location you choose. Um, but you also still get that special small group experience that we've been talking about with Putney and that we're known for in the seminars. And outside of the seminars, each day we have a vibrant menu of afternoon activities and evening events to choose from led by our faculty and staff. We have a amazing series of renowned guest speakers who come in, cultural excursions and activities on the weekends. Um, so they're really highly structured programs. The schedule is jam-packed and the students always have a diverse assortment of opportunities to engage in. There's so much more I can tell you about Oxford Academia programs, but I encourage you to check out the website and give us a call if you want to learn more. I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, and we also have an Oxford Academia webinar happening one week from today, Thursday at 3.30. So we highly encourage you to join that too. And now I will turn it back over to Julian to highlight some more of our collaborations. Thanks, Becca. So um, another one of our awesome collaborations uh, we've had, this is actually gonna be the fifth year we're running the Harvard's Chan Sea Change Youth Summit on Climate Equity and Health. Uh, this is an opportunity for students to tackle the intertwined crises of climate change and public health. Uh, it's an eight day residential program in Boston with the Center for Climate, Health and the Global Environment at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Um, it's a really great opportunity to bring together students from all over the US and also abroad uh, to learn about how to take action in climate and health issues uh, and become change makers in their own communities and their careers going forward. So I've gotten to visit it a couple the last few years and it's it's been a fantastic uh, thing to witness. Really passionate students, really intelligent, uh, really like enthusiastic speakers and just a great experience. Students choose an action focus group, which becomes their angle to approach the climate crisis or public health, uh, depending which, you know, which group it is. Uh, they're looking at one or the other typically, but also how they overlap uh, and identify solutions and work towards solutions. So a portion of each day, they're working within sm a small group of peers uh, with an instructor within that action focus group. And each student also develops a community action plan, which is their plan for how they're going to take what they're learning in Boston and apply it into their own lives and communities at home. Um, so students learn alongside leading scientists, public health experts, advocates, policymakers, and other contacts that Harvard provides uh, for this program because they want to have a, a they want to have uh, opportunities to work with high school students and get them involved. Um, so students, there's a lot of uh, field trips, there's excursions, uh, there's, we have meetings with uh, meteorologists in Boston, typically. Um, we visit the MIT Museum and, and meet scientists there. Lots of really interesting possibilities on that program. We also have full and, and partial scholarship funding available for students uh, on the Harvard program. Uh, moving on, we also partner with the Columbia Climate School. Um, the Climate School is the first new school at Columbia in 25 years and was started very recently to transform Columbia into a hub for climate research and education. 
and solutions. Uh, and so they also wanted to create opportunities for high school students to get involved in climate work and research. Um, so they reached out to us and we've been running this Columbia Climate School in the Green Mountains program. Uh, also, this is gonna be the fifth year of that program. It's a two week program. Uh, we, we stay at, uh, in Castleton, Vermont and Columbia professors actually come up and teach seminars and lead activities and workshops with our students. So we really get to learn about cutting edge innovations and solutions to the climate crisis. Similar to Harvard, students will develop a community action plan to take their learning into life at home or in college or their career. Um, and we have some, uh, some weekend excursions to take advantage of Vermont's natural beauty. And we have a lot of great connections in Vermont uh, being from here for, and running for a long time. So we, um, you know, we go up to Burlington and meet with Burlington Electric and learn how they are transforming their energy grid. Uh, into renew a renewable energy grid, um, things like that. And then we also have scholarship funding available for this program, full and partial scholarships are available. Uh, next, we're gonna head over to Smithsonian with my colleague, Mike. Thanks everyone for sticking around. We got a lot to cover, but this is the last uh, piece right here. And then we'll have some time for some Q&A. So I mentioned earlier that I manage our collaboration with the Smithsonian Institution. In 2020, uh, the Smithsonian reached out to Putney Student Travel, interested in uh, beginning a collaboration to kind of partner their 175 years of experience with Putney's 74 years of experience to create educational programs for students around the world. So the Smithsonian is the world's largest research education uh, and museum complex. And with their vast, vast resources and expertise, combined with Putney's, uh, again, seven decades of running student programs, we offer Smithsonian student travel. It's an opportunity for obviously like-minded peers uh, to come together with our experienced trip leaders and Smithsonian student travel experts uh, to provide learning opportunities for students. So these are small group programs, again, eighth through 12th graders. We offer 10 different destinations in 2025. And as I mentioned before, every program is joined by a Smithsonian student travel expert for four or five days of the trip. Depending on the destination, you know, our programs range from 10 days to, to almost three weeks or more. Uh, and these experts join for about four or five days uh, on each itinerary. We see Dr. Nidi Bathala here. She joins us in Costa Rica. She's a wildlife biologist. Uh, Dr. Robert Stevens, uh, Stephen joins us in Greece and Italy. He's an expert on all things Rome and Roman history and art and architecture and archaeology. And uh, just a great opportunity for, again, students to travel that are in intellectually curious with like-minded peers. Um, and it brings all that the Smithsonian has to offer uh, with their history of diffusing and increasing knowledge around the world. So you can give us a call and uh, talk about the Smithsonian programs as well. You can ask for me or any of my colleagues that coordinate the programs specifically. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to um, my colleagues here to see if there's any questions that you